uh, my name's Andy Gross, and I'm with uh, Lenaro, and I'm on the IoT team, uh, what we call Light. So I had given this talk uh, two weeks ago in Lenaro Connect. I kind of mixed up my slides a little bit because uh, most people here are going to be more familiar with Device Tree than some of the people that, that were there. Um, but basically, if you go and you look at uh, the way that Zephyr works today, um, configuration is done generally through um, kconfig. And the configuration is kind of spread throughout the system. Um, for any one board, um, whether it be NXP, uh, Kinetis, or uh, some of the ST uh, uh, microelectronics boards, you'll see the same thing. Um, there's two directory structures that you can look through, uh, arch, arm, sock, and then there's a board uh, directory underneath there, and there's also a board slash and then uh, a board specific one as well. If you go into both of those directories and you look around, you'll see a multitude of kconfig files. And inside those kconfig files, you'll see lots of information like uh, SRAM base address, number of UARTs, uh, lots of different um, configuration parameters on the different IP blocks that are in the uh, socks. And you'll see that most of this conf configuration is hard-coded. If you go and you look at the def config that's actually used to generate the, uh, uh, the initial configuration, um, when you run the make def config, it goes through and creates this big kconfig file that basically contains all of these uh, values. If you look through all that and you compare them between boards, you'll see a lot of the same stuff. Um, and even between boards that are very similar, like if you go and you look at the ST microelectronics boards, you'll see very small variations. I mean, there'll be a lot of the same information because a lot of the boards are very similar. Um, things that where you'll see differences are is like let's say um, a multiple devices, like let's say two GPIOs versus five, uh, three UARTs versus one, uh, things of that nature. Um, the other thing is, is that some of the definitions can come from uh, multiple file sources in the system. Um, whether it be SIMSYS headers, which are generated from the ARM or from the vendor, um, or other include files that are just created. Um, the thing about this is it's not very extensible for similar boards. What you'll find is uh, people actually copy and create new directories for variations of boards. And so that means you actually have to copy things around and then modify it to be specific to that very, that specific board that you're working on. The driver and board in initialization is very similar. Uh, again, things come down to the kconfig. Um, there's a lot of ifdefs that are used to work their way around device multiples um, and also used for uh, initialization. Um, like, let's say you have an MPU. Well, if you have one, there's an ifdef block, you, you run through that. If there's not, it's, it's compiled out. Um, if you have multiple UARTs, um, you'll see this in the driver code. You'll see ifdef UART zero, and you'll have a block that does static uh, structures, and then it'll do the device API and init call. And you'll see, you know, UART 0, UART 1, UART 2. And you'll see the same thing for the GPIOs. Um, so that, that to me is, it's a little hard to take. Um, to be able to add more UART ports, you have to actually add code. Um, and these are hard-coded init structures too, so uh, th that define the platform data. So, you know, how can, we, how can we do things differently and make it a little bit more easier to deal with? My thoughts around that are basically, well, Let's, let's see if we can use device tree for this. Now, in the Linux kernel, device tree is used not only for um, you know, configuration and saying what's on the board, it's also used during runtime. In our case, runtime can be a little difficult because we don't have a lot of space. But, and, and I'll get to that later, but we can talk about some of the things of, why, of how and why we'd want to use device tree for Zephyr. One, device trees are architecturally neutral. Um, it doesn't matter if you're on ARM, x86, ARC, doesn't matter. You can, uh, you can define the system. Um, we would need less kconfig options. Um, the reason for that is, is that uh, the configuration information would actually be described in the DTS. And instead of having things like SRAM address and number of UARTs and, and even base addresses, uh, IRQs and all that stuff, you can actually get that out of the DTS. You don't need a kconfig option for that. Um, device tree is very um, extensible. You can use it to describe anything. Um, if you have some differentiation in node information, like uh, you know, UARTs are always going to have baud rate. They're always going to have a base address, IRQ, um, pins. There may be other things that make 
one board different from another, you can actually describe that. Um, other layers could possibly use the device tree information, perhaps, um, and they can actually glean that information from the compiled DTB or even the DTS file, and they can do that during compile time. Um, the other thing that, that's really nice about this approach is, is adding boards, new boards and new socks is a whole lot easier. Um, in, in a lot of cases, you can reuse a lot of the same DTS information. If you look in the Linux kernel, you'll actually see uh, DTS files broken apart. Um, you'll see DTSI files, which uh, generally give you a, a bunch of generic information for a SOC. And then as you, as you get more specific, you can actually do includes. You can have your generic SOC, and then you can have an actual board spe specification. It includes the gener generic SOC and only turns on the pieces that it needs, and then adds additional information to describe specific things about the board that make it different than the generic uh, SOC. So, so that makes it a whole lot easier. And, and the other thing is, is that with the, the smaller DTS files that I'm talking about for the, for the boards, you immediately see what the differences are in the boards and how they're configured. So I kind of alluded to this just a minute ago. So to blob or not to blob. So with device tree, you have two things. You have the DTS files themselves, and you have what the output of the compiler gives you, which is a flattened device tree blob if that's what you specify when you do the compile. Um, when I originally started thinking about this, I was thinking of just using the DT DTC compiler as a, uh, uh, an error checker, doing a DTS to DTS, and then parsing the DTS file itself. I found that um, there's a ton of tools to actually look at and break down DTB files. There's not a lot of tools that parse DTS files themselves. So even though I don't think that we want to use the device tree blob in the runtime, um, I would probably still compile it to be a DTB just so I can parse it and, and use existing tools. I mean, I like writing code, but I don't like reinventing the wheel. So when I can leverage other people's work, I, I really try to do that. Um, so we're only interested in defining the configuration and the board initialization information. We aren't. We aren't looking at runtime information. We're not going to use this you know, in a running system. The thing about it is, is that a DTB file itself, when you compile it, can be fairly large. I mean, with respect to the kinds of systems that we're talking about. I, uh, I compiled a very small DTS file and uh, got, I think it was, uh, it was either 4K or 8K. Well, that's huge. So, so yeah, we, we can't use the DTB as is, uh, not, not without finding some way to pare it down if that's what we want to do. And I, and I don't think that's the answer. Space usage is at a premium. You know, we're talking about systems with, what, 192K flash, maybe? Um, we can't blow through that much, uh, that much using a, a, a DTB. So this approach requires a little bit of tooling. So the first thing is, is that when we create the DTS files, and this is even true with the current kconfig options and even the include files that are in the system, a lot of them leverage either SimSys headers or vendor files that are you know, defined somewhere, whether it be in the ext hal or, or whatever. We would still want to do this. Um, when people write a DTS file, it makes more sense when they, when they enter in the configurations to actually use uh, uh, <coughs> names that make sense. So, so instead of having, let's say, a, a base address, that you would just say, OK, well, it's, it's hex 40, 40, 40 million. Well, they may have a header somewhere that says, oh no, this is UR0 base address. Well, that makes more sense. Plug that in there and pull that include information in to the DTS file. And you can actually do that. You can, you can have include files. Uh, the Linux kernel does that. They have a, their own separate directory structure where they store the stuff. Um, the thing about the Linux kernel, though, is, is that people tend to uh, split uh, the definitions in the DT, DT include area. It's only pound defines. Um, in a lot of these files that we have in Zephyr, there's a mixture of structures and uh, pound-defined information. And that's actually a problem for, for parsing. The C preprocessor has no problem with this. The DTC compiler does. So that stuff has to be split out. So in my initial work, I kind of just said, well, I'll, I'll figure out how to deal with that. And I kind of went past that. I mean, I've got to go back and, and, and fix that. But the idea is, is we want to leverage the include files. We want to use the C preprocessor to, to, to allow us to do that. We've just got to be able to split the information out or get the SimSys, uh, the ARM guys, and or the vendors to split it out for us in a way that makes sense. 
that's probably a, a tougher sell than it is to just parse it in some way and split the information. So the idea is, is that we need to build our configuration. So we have to go through a process of collecting the include information, pre-process and replace, run it through the DTC compiler, and then once it's done, we have a format that we can actually parse and create an include file that not only includes some pound-defined information that we need, but also would include uh, structures that are required. So what I've been doing in the near term, this, this is the past few weeks I've been working on the parsing of the, of the DTP file. Um, that also has, has involved actually defining the DTS files for at least the, the NXP Freedom Board. I've also looked at the TI um, and ST boards. I've pulled the data sheets and started pulling together the information to create the DTS files. In some of these cases, some of these uh, SOC vendors actually have this information or can generate it. Um, but I'm a glutton for punishment, so I'm doing it by hand, which is fun. Um, but the good thing about that is, is I actually am learning a lot about the different uh, socks out there. Um, it, it's funny how similar a lot of them are. Um, yeah, they're all Cortex M based, but some of the uh, other IP blocks that you have to have are very similar. So the DTS files have to be in place, and then we need the tooling uh, to, to create the include files. That's what I've been working on right now. So I've, I've worked up a Python uh, script that uses uh, uh, Pi FDP, um, which is a fairly nice, uh, simple uh, DTB parser. And I've uh, created a, a small include file that I'm going to show here once I, I get through the, some of the DT information I'm going to show. Um, once the configuration is generated, that can actually be used uh, in the make files as part of the make process. Um, when all this is done, I, the way I see this falling out is, is that we're going to be able to clean up a lot of the configuration uh, directories. We're not going to have a lot of this kconfig spread out in the system. Um, of course, we're going to have to have kconfig. That's, that's going to be required for, you know, just to get different things working properly. But it's not going to contain a lot of the configuration specific information that probably had no business being in kconfig to begin with. Um, and since that's the case, uh, you know, like the board directory, if you go and you look at the board directory, there's not a lot in it. And in fact, the board.c file is empty. So perhaps we can get rid of at least one of these directories and have everything in, in one or the other. Um, the last step, of course, I mean, you know, we want to leverage the, the generated files in the make. So the last part of this is, is okay, we've got the board, uh, configured, we've got the board initialized, now we've got to deal with the drivers. So we're going to have the information that we've pulled out of the DTS files, and we've got to work within the API, device API and init function calls to get the device drivers the information they need. Um, I've looked a lot at the, the different drivers and how they work. Um, I have some concerns with the pen muxing and the GPIO, but I think we can work through that. That may require some changes to the APIs. Um, but we'll get there. So I'm going to pause here real quick. Um, do we have any questions before I actually give some of the DT, uh, a DT example? Okay. I don't know if that's good or bad. So, <laughs> so uh, I took the Freedom Board and I created a, a device tree file. And if you're familiar with device tree or if you've looked at it in the Linux, Linux kernel, you'll see some very similar things. Um, the first thing is uh, we're going to have a, a board compatible, um, which gives us, uh, you generally are going to have more than one compatible name. Um, and it goes from least specific to more specific. So this is a K64F, and the board is the MK64F12. Or at least I think that's what the name is. So that's, that's what I encoded here. It has one uh, M4F processor. Um, it has some SRAM at, uh, what is that, 20 million hex? And the SRAM has, uh, I, I don't know, it's 192K, I think. Um, and then you have the actual SOC uh, structure, which actually will contain the device nodes themselves. The uh, ARM Cortex-M, it has an interrupt controller called the INVIC. So we have a compatible block um, where we say, okay, this is an INVIC. Uh, here's where 
it resides. The two things in here that are important, and this actually change between different socks, are the number of priority bits and the number of IRQs. In some cases, a lot of uh, vendors already have this information defined in SIMSYS or in their, their extended SIMSYS uh, header file. But we'd also want to put that here, and the num instead of having numbers here, you'd actually want to plug in the SIMSYS pound defines for these guys. In my case, I didn't, um, but that's how you'd do it. Cortex-M4F, they have, it has a timer block, which is the uh, SysTick. Um, probably going to need a little bit more fleshing out of that information. I put in a clock source because it's either the AHB or it's AHB divided by 8. There may or may not be an MPU that you want to define. Um, I have it disabled here. If you did define it, you would have some regions that you would want to specify for the security. Uh, on the Freedom Boards, you have a master clock uh, uh, generator. Master. It's, it's their master clock control. Um, that's where their system clock is, and I denote that with the system clock frequency. This is one of the things you'll see all through the system. Um, the system clock frequency is, uh, depending on which board it is, will be defined in a K config somewhere. This is definitely one of the things that would change between boards, <coughs> and you see it a lot, actually. The, uh, they also have an oscillator um, and an RTC. These don't matter that much, I, but I wanted to at least enumerate them here to show how, how we're going to describe these things in DT. Um, when, dri what, when the driver is initialized, the, things, the kinds of things that you need are you know, the base address, um, the IRQs, things of that nature, and we have that information here. Um, and we'll have an IRQ example down here. Yes. Yes. Is the clock source a magic number, or is that a reference to somewhere else in the device tree? That's a magic number. Okay. So, the, the, I think if it was AHB divided by eight, it'd be one. Yeah. And I, I and I wanted I should have put a pound defined in here, but I didn't want to mix things right now. I just wanted to keep it very clean. Uh, the SIM uh, node in the uh, Freedom Board is actually a, a clock gating control. So not only do, does it have some clock gating, it also has some uh, divider information about the different buses. You're going to see this one um, referenced later. So the UART, this is a good example. So UART has a base address. It, it has a label. The labels are used in the div device API and init. It has at least one interrupt, a baud rate, um, and it has some pins that are defined. I set up something very similar to the Linux kernel with the pin controls. For most devices, you're going to want to have a default pin control or a pin muxing that denotes the active set of pins for the device, and you're also going to want to define a low power mode. The reason why you want to do that is, is that some of these devices are going to be operating off coin cells, so you're going to want to be able to put these things in low power mode, which that, that means you need to be able to describe the pins in a way that the driver knows which set is active and which set isn't. And so I did that here to show an example. Um, I'm going to skip UART 1 because it's basically just like UART 0. The difference was I was too lazy to uh, enumerate the, uh, the pins on that. <laughs> I didn't want to have to look through the chart. But let's go to the pin mux uh, device. So this is actually the node in the system that controls the pin muxing. And I defined the different pin sets here, at least for the things that I used in this file. So you'll see a UART 0 default. Um, you'll see a port, which points to the GPIO port that these pins sit off of. And on this board, I think there's like five or six GPIOs. Pin 16, 17, and then there's a function, which actually denotes what the function that you want to set in the, uh, the pin mux. So there may be up to like, I don't know, five or six different functions for a pin. And depending, depending on how you have your, your board set up, you want it set one way or another. Uh, for the low power mode for these two pins, you want to set it to a GPIO and probably probably put a pull up. I didn't put a pull up here. Uh, for the spy pins, um, those also reside off of GPIO B uh, 10, 9, 10, and 11 function 2. Yeah. So after that one, we have some of the GPIO nodes. Um, and you'll see here um, there's a label GPIO A and GPIO B. The GPIOB is what I referenced to before. So that's how we can get the addresses for some of these things when we do the parsing. Um, we have a spy node here, which gives you some, 
some, some slight differences. Um, the thing about SPI is, is you have chip selects, so you've got to be able to define those, and those are typically GPIOs. And you'll see here that it's GPIOB uh, pins 9 and 10. Um, if you noticed before, 9, 10, and 11 were being used for the MISO, MOSI, and CLOCK, so I have two of these are wrong. Um, they need to be something else. But this is just, just an example just to show you how it would look. Um, and you'll see here that the clocks, there's a clock gate for this guy. And it, uh, it's a reference back to the SIM, and it gives you the offset, and it gives you the bit. So with this information, I'd be able to figure out what address and what bit in the, uh, in the clock gating uh, node to go and set to enable the clock. I didn't do spy, the second spy instance just uh, for time. So with this file that I defined, I wrote a, a Python script to use the, uh, the, the, the PyFDT, and I, I parsed some of the information. Um, out of that, I generated uh, a small include file. And this would be one of the uh, things that we output from, from, the, um, from the DTB file. So all of the systems need an SRAM base address, and that's, that's what's used for, for saying, okay, this is where things reside. Um, as I parse the system, and I only got to the UARTs, I'm, I'm still working through this, um, but I pulled the, UART, the number of UARTs out, the base address, all the information we'd need for, for the device API and init, or at least to build up a structure to pass to it, and some of the IRQ definition information. This file is going to get bigger as I add the extra parsing for all the different nodes. Um, but this gives you an idea of what the include file is going to look like. And if you go and you look at the kconfigs, you'll see the same information. It's just that I collate it from the DTS file. I don't have it spread out in the system. So I'll pause real quick for any questions before going on. Okay. I think that, that was the last slide, but one thing I wanted to add, and I, and I must have cut that from, from this. The other thing that we want to be able to do with the DTS is to pull the cake, or to pull the driver options that, that we're actually using. So in the Linux kernel, there's, there's a, a thing called dt2config. And they use that to, they run it over the system and the DTP file that's generated. And they're able to actually figure out what all the options are in the system that need to be configured properly to, to have the correct drivers compiled. I think we want to do the same thing. We have all the information we need about what devices are in the system. We'll be able to figure out what kconfig options or def config options that we need to turn on. If you have a UART, okay, you want a UART driver. If you don't have a spy driver, you don't need it. Um, if you have, you know, different things configured, we want to turn it on. So that's a, that's another output that we're going to have from from the uh, DTS file is we're going to get a kconfig, a set of kconfig options. Um, and that, I believe is all I have. So, unless anybody has it, okay. Yeah, you mentioned something about um, things from an include file. I got the impression maybe data structures flowing into your DTS. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? What, what the concept is? I get oh, okay. The yeah, so, so like in the, uh, so let's, so let's, let's use the SimSys as a great example. So there's SimSys headers out there that um, a vendor may have extended. It contains a bunch of information. Some of the information is actually the base addresses for a lot of these things. Um, instead of using, if I do an include of the, the SimSys file at the top of the DTS, then anything that I define or use in there would be able to be processed by the C preprocessor. That's the idea. Um, that's, that's really all we want to do. Um, the thing is, is that with these files, I'm going to have to split out the C structures from the pound defines because the DTC compiler doesn't like it. It fails when you run it. Right. I'm just trying to imagine, visualize how you're taking that structure and, and put it in. So you'd say something like, just a totally stupid example, you'd say clock divider bus equals some structure. I mean, it's a totally nonsensical thing, but... Well, let's say interrupts equals, because there you have like three fields. And then you want to be able to drop in the data structure there. It depends. So, yeah, so let's say, let's, let's use pinmox as a great example. 
I think PinMox, we're going to absolutely have to create a, a structure because there's no way you can pound to find your way around that. So um, in a system, we, you'd want to define all the different pin combinations that you want to have ac possibly have active when the system runs. And then the application, what, you know, whatever driver it is, is going to have to go through and figure out, OK, I, I need these three sets of pins. I have the information I need. Just use it. So things like that are going to have to be in a structure. And the reason for that is because you're then going to flow it through to your include file, which you showed in a couple slides. Right. Output. So the output yeah, of the parsing is this guy. Right. So, so we won't just have pound defines in here. We're also going to have some data structures that are consumed by the system. And they're going to have to be, use well-known names um, so that the rest of the system can use them properly. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, that makes sense. I knew there was going to be more to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know, the first part of it was just uh, using some of the like simplest information in the system, and one of those things is the uh, SRAM base address because without that, nothing works. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the first things I did. Now I've just got to plug it in. So I'm at a point now where I can just I can uh, add my generic board include file and strip out the information that we don't need, and then it, it'll work. So yes. Right now they do. Um, so how will this? Because this is uh, generating the same kind of uh, error file that the K config generates. Yeah. So the difference is this. So this is where the the driver init stuff is going to have to change a little bit. If we know how many UART ports we have and we have the UART information we need, we can just say, okay, you know, for the number of UART ports, call this device API and init with the structure we build up for it. And we know how many structures we need to build up, and we have the structure information that we need. We could probably use a macro for that. So some things we can macro around and not have to have the, the big if def blocks in the, in the driver. We just need something that says, OK, you have a UART. Go and uh, create some number of instances of the UART. That's all you got to do. You don't need that in the UART file itself. You need it somewhere. What we, what we would use in this case is, is like, let's say we had two UARTs. We'd have two, number of UARTs, two. We'd have port zero information, port one information. We'd have a function or whatever that says, OK, for you know, I is zero to the number of UART ports. You know, macro, do something, and then device API and init. That, that's the difference between how it works now, which is you've got these if def, if I have five GPIO ports, I have to say if def GPIO A, if def GPIO B, C, D, E. Um, we don't want to do that. So we can write a function that you just, just loops through the number of UARTs and pulls the information that it needs and do it that way. And I would, I would think we'd want to do that for every instance where we're going to have device multiples, not just UARTs, by I, I squared C, things of that nature. Yes. It will be equal to post-processed information, but it will be done kind of by the parts that you need to generate. Let's say if you go to the driver, the drivers, they have instances. Yeah. What you do is, as per se, you create two function um, API tables. Right. And the partial from this will just go and create as many as needed. Right. Will that be in a C file? Uh, yeah. OK. So you basically, you won't have to write this hash in text. Right. You're still going to have some information that you're going to have to create. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can get around that. Um, but you won't have to have this if-def stuff going on. Okay. Yeah. The idea is you don't want to have to keep modifying the driver files themselves when you add an, another instance. You want to be able to handle this in, a, in an easier way. So. Yeah, we could. Yeah, because that would get rid of the stupid string compare. We have to do any and binding. I just put the strings in here because that's what was no, being no, done. No, I know. I'm just asking. But I'm completely happy with changing it to a unique number. Yeah, I don't like string compares either. <laughs> so, 
and when I saw that, I was like, you know, everybody kind of does things a little bit different because you'll see UART zero or it, it's a different format for everybody, it seems like. Yeah. That's the other thing. Either you have to enforce the standard or come up with some other way of dealing with it. Yeah. And that's the other thing about this is we'll probably have to enforce a little bit of a standard on uh, some, some of the definitions just so that, you know, you don't have to do special stuff for all the different boards. So, you know, SRAM base address is, is, of course, the same across everything. But some of these other things we need to actually kind of change people to use a, the generic uh, generated names. So. Yeah. What happens to people who will want to use the same driver in the next multiple operating systems? Man, that's always a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Because, yeah, for like the EXT HAL stuff, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, anyway, basically, if I have a driver for, let's say, my IP, I want to put the same driver. It's a simple IP, you are yeah. just can do for the and the seats, so I want to print name of the or number of the IP that's running this code at some point. Right, then, then that would cause, yeah. yeah. In, in the driver itself, because people print if in this one. Other right. That right. Um, and I think we'd kind of run into that problem regardless, wouldn't we? I mean, with some things. Oh, I think if you have um, hundreds of data around, which has a different problem than I agree. Yeah. Right, and I, and I see where some people have kind of done these wrappers. If they're leveraging some of the ext HAL stuff, you don't see the, you kind of have to kind of follow it a little bit to see that they're actually calling out into the ext HAL. Uh, so yeah, we probably have to do something similar. Uh, Is there, we talked about, Eleanor, about you know, dev boards where you can have headers and you can have the same pins be GPO, I2C, SPIO. Is there a notion of like a master DTS where you have all the different possibilities yeah. that you can generate one? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's where the DTS files come in. You can generate all the different combinations, and then in the actual board specific file, you can say, I'm only interested in these. You're only going to use the ones that you, you're actually going to use. And is there, is there checking you don't use the same pins twice? No, so the DTS doesn't have that. You'd have to have your own checker. I know in your case, TI's case, you have your own tool that generates that stuff. And it does a lot of that checking. But um, I'm not quite sure how that would be enforceable. And there may be cases where you want to, uh, you know, switch from one device to another um, where they're going to reuse the same pens anyway. And y you would normally see that as a collision, and it's really not. Right? Yeah, the run runtime. Yeah. So... I guess we're done if we have no other questions. So, so thank you uh, for coming. <laughs>